Hello and welcome to episode 37 of Hitting the Bar, the football podcast. I'm Chris Carl. And I'm Jeff Saunders. Well, Jeff, uh, before we move on to what's happened this week, let's have your trivia question. This is another one that uh, our mate Steve will be interested in, because one of the answers is over 100 years old. But <laughs> which four players have scored the most goals for England whilst they were Chelsea players? Okay, so they were Chelsea players at the time they played for England. Which four players have scored the most goals for England? I think three of them most people should get the fourth one almost no one will get so I'll give it to you now it's a guy called George Hilsden and he got these goals between 1907 and 1909 right yeah unlikely anybody get that but the rest of them we shall uh, leave to the end of the show okay all right now then uh, what a week in the Premier League of course Liverpool finally beaten indeed yeah and, and, and soundly so and deservedly so yes it was uh, you know Watford have had this in them all season and as I, as I kept saying here Watford's problem has been scoring the goals. Their play has been very good. Nigel Pearson's coming in. Seems to have worked his worked his magic. They they were well worth the win. They were they played really really well. By all accounts that I've read in the press since, people were saying they could have actually won by more. Yeah, um, that's possible. But you know you, you shouldn't read too much into that because not every goal attempt ends up in being a goal, does it? No, in any but game. But it was a worthy win. And yeah, that was my point. Basically, three 0 wasn't flattering. No, not not at all. No. no. But before that, Watford had actually been the team that had come closest to beating Liverpool this season before. That's true, that's mm. true. West Ham almost did it the week before last, didn't they? Yeah, and, and you know, if only they, they had this, you got some points for almost. <laughs> you know, we, we'd win the league every year. Yeah, and I'd be married and rich. Um, <laughs> however, they almost did it, but uh, Watford, incredible, 3-0. Uh, um, Jurgen Klopp said that it, w- it was almost like a relief because now that they were chasing the invincible mm. title, if you like, which there's no trophy for as you said to me the invincible title for uh, that Arsenal have that's been taken away now Arsenal fans you know are very pettily happy about it but for Jurgen Klopp and his players is it a relief do you think I mean I, I, I do think it is and and if you look at their performances the closer they came to this magic 17 wins in a row 18 mm. wins in a row the, the performance the, the, the quality of the performance had dropped off no question so now they can just say okay let's get back to what we do and just start playing again and I think they might well go unbeaten for the rest of the season I think it's quite likely they almost had a scare from Norwich then they lost in the Champions League then they almost had a scare from West Ham it has been coming hasn't it it, it has been coming no but, question yeah. but then if you keep on winning and winning and winning like that and, and credibly so and, and, and quite emphatically eventually you're going to get tired eventually you're going to you're going to have a bad day eventually one day surely it's of course you are yeah just because uh, Arsenal didn't in that one season doesn't mean that it's that easy no no and, and and it's not easy, and and the proof of that is the fact that it hasn't been done for you know since Jesus was a lad. Yes, yeah. I mean, it was when when Arsenal did uh, do that. Football was in black and white, wasn't it? Yeah, it's people, a long time ago. People walked very quickly. Didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Arsenal TV is now called the History Channel. <laughs> um, but still, Arsenal did do it, and the Arsenal fans are relieved. And uh, Gary Lineker on Twitter said uh, when Watford beat Liverpool, that was Arsenal's best result of the season because they've actually got something to celebrate. They have something to celebrate now, which is desperately sad isn't it yes in- instead of celebrating the things that you've done you celebrate somebody fa- else failing it's very sad isn't it, it is we've had this before that conversation that you know Arsenal fans tend to talk about Tottenham more than Tottenham fans talk about Arsenal very much so despite yeah. the fact that Tottenham have been in Arsenal's shadow up until recent times Tottenham fans co- sort of concentrate on their own misery rather than being jealous of somebody else but that's just the way Arsenal fans generally are sorry Steve if you're listening but that is the case very much so and but it's also the case that Tottenham do have a lot of misery to talk about <laughs> that's true yeah. <laughs> They're too busy. They just haven't got yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll come on to Tottenham in a minute, but let's continue with Arsenal because they beat Portsmouth, whoopity do, in the uh, FA Cup. They're from, through to the next round. From two divisions below them, and they beat them 2 0. Yes. You know, it's just, <laughs> oh, whoopee. I mean, so what? But they have, they have started to win games now, Arsenal, instead of drawing them. They are pulling themselves up the league a little bit. A little bit, yeah. I think this, this is the, uh, the first year since 1999 that the Wanderers will not play Europe. European football in March. Wow. Yeah, you, do you remember the, the round of 16 in the in the Champions League was also always called the Arsenal round. That's right. Because yeah. that was the that was the round where Arsenal went out. 
And actually, yes. And and there we are. I mean, I say they've started to win games, but actually they got knocked out of the Europa League this last in week. In the round of 32. Yeah, 32. So yeah. should we rename the, the, the Euro Vars round of 32 the Wanderers round? The Wanderers now? round, yes. Um, well, they won't be wandering around Europe, that's for sure. I've never been a fan of Arteta. As anyone, all you listeners who, who've listened to this in the last few weeks know very well, I, I think he's massively overrated. But Arteta's comments following the, the loss in the Vars and, and, and the win last night, He's turning into Jose Mourinho. It's like he's like he's a Joan Armour trading fan, you know. <laughs> her, her, her most famous song, "Me, Myself, and I." You know, <laughs> this, uh, Arteta saying, "I think we did a lot of positive things. I think we created enough. Oh, I left out several first choice players because they were mentally drained. Please." And then I know it's risky to play them in this competition. In other words, how brave am I that I played mm. them in this competition? I assessed the team, and physically, some of them were knackered. Some of them had issues. Some of them were mentally were hanging on to what happened that day. So I tried to pick the right team. And he's well, turning he into did. Mourinho. He is, yeah. I mean, you'd hope he did pick the right team. That's his, that's his sole job, really. Well, do you think Apart so? putting yeah. the cones out. Apart from putting the cones out <laughs> and, and watering the pitch first. And You've got to water the pitch before you put the cones <laughs> Otherwise, you get little little circles of dry grass. And that'll, no. that'll mentally drain the players. Oh, it'd be, yeah, be terrible. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that is a sort of Mourinho thing. Me, myself, and I are like that. Yeah, but he, he's, uh, he's obviously quite sure of himself, if you put it in a, a positive spin. Yeah, uh, maybe, yeah. But uh, I think it's much more about getting you excuses in early and, mm. you know, stop it, stopping the negative comment from the press. Yeah, I mean, if they continue as they have been in the league without much improvement, there could be no European football whatsoever, not even the Vars, the European Losers' Cup or whatever you want to call it. There could be no European football at Arsenal at all next season, which means that Aubameyang will go. Go. Oh, no question. Without a doubt, surely. I, I, I think Aubameyang will go anyway because a player that good should be playing in the Champions League. He is their one player who is worthy of playing in a, a top four team in any of the big European leagues. And y- you'd like to see him playing in the Champions League because that's where he belongs. He's I, that good. I was going to say, yeah, I would like to see how good he can be with good players around him. Well, indeed. Yeah, yeah indeed. He's, he's incredible. The issue for Arsenal, uh, apart from trying to hang on to the, the one good player, the really good player they've got, is they, they posted this, uh, this loss last week when, the, when their accounts came out. 20, 27 million loss and something mm. like a, a, an almost £100 million pound turnaround year yep. on year. What people forget is that that is last year. So that doesn't include loss of Champions League income this year. And that doesn't include the money they paid for Pepe, £72 million, or anyone else they bought on the summer. So their financial results are going to get much worse next year, and there'll be no European football TV money to make it up. Now, wow. if you think that's bad... It, it actually, is. <laughs> it actually gets a lot worse than that, because Stan Kroenke, who owns them has put all of his money, well, or all of the bank's money, into this super stadium that he's been building for the Los Angeles Rams and maybe the Los Angeles Chargers. Delighting Arsenal fans everywhere. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> with that. and that's where his money's going. Now, this, this incredible stadium... Tottenham Stadium cost a billion. Mm-hmm. Right, the stadiums of that sort of sixty, seventy thousand size tend to cost a billion now. Right, mm-hmm. have a guess how much Stan Kroenke's Wonder Stadium is 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 going to cost. I don't know. I'd like to think five billion. Come on, no, shut the front door. Five it was, million. It, it was originally budgeted at I think one point nine billion. Good and God. now they're they're forecasting five billion, and it will open pretty much a year late. What five billion for? Does that mean everybody gets their own apartment within the stadium? That's ridiculous. No, it, it is. Hell? It is more than just a stadium. It's obviously got shopping malls, entertainment centres, right. hotels, all that sort of stuff. But even so, it's it's an astonishing number. So if you, if Arsenal fans, if you want to know where your money's gone, that's you're gonna have to get yourself over there and have a look. That's right. Yeah. And before Man United fans start getting, oh, well, that's going to be great. Uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have got, I think it's forty nine million dollars cap rate room. So, the, the basically, the amount of money they can spend on salaries. Right, right, right yeah. They've got 49 million. So, so money's going to come out of Man United, get put into the Tampa Bay Buccaneers before the start of the next NFL season. So, I don't, I'm not sure that Man United fans 
are going to be any happier. Any happier. But they may very well have European football next season. Yeah. At least. But if things were bad at Arsenal last season, then you've got to add in the Pepe, the Pepe price. Yep. Then you've got to add in no European football this season, uh, which is then is compounded by the fact that nobody will want to go to Arsenal, player-wise, and a lot will leave. Next season could be quite horrendous for Arsenal. What well, a shame. Well, well indeed. <laughs> and, and, you know, as, as Manchester United have found, they're in year seven of their, their rebuilding. Yeah. <laughs> And yes. and the best players are not choosing to go to Manchester no, United anymore. No, and those that are there are wanting to leave. Paul Pogba, yeah. who, however, like him or not. I mean, Graham Souness was criticising him on Sunday when uh, Man United were playing Everton and the other guests uh, or the hosts on the uh, Super Sunday on Sports Sky Sports TV had to tell him, you know... To, to, You've got an obsession with Paul Pogba. He's not even playing and you're criticising him. It was a bit ridiculous, I have to say. But to which I hope Sooner said, well, that's the point, isn't it? <laughs> well, maybe that is actually. That is the point. He's, he's uh, injured, so they say. Oh, please. Yeah, yeah. Bl- with m- mental stress maybe, I don't know. M- mental stress, that's probably quite likely, yeah. 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 Pogba, Pogba is one of them better players, or more expensive so, players, yeah. uh, and it goes downhill from there. So they're not going to attract anybody of his like next season, are they? Unless, mm. strangely, they get into the Champions uh, league positions, which is possible. It is possible, yeah. I'm no Man United fan, as you know, but and I do want them to keep Solskjaer as their manager for as long as possible. Oh, really? You but think he's yeah. that bad? Well, uh, um, yeah. I, he, I mean, he, he should not be in a job like that. But there is actually something quite likable about him. You, oh yeah, you, you put him up against Mourinho or or the groundsman in, <laughs> in their in the things they say to the press, and you don't hear the word "I" coming out of no, you of don't. mouth. He talks "we." He talks "we," and he doesn't he doesn't have much of a blame game. No. Or the opposite, you know, oh, the players were tired, it's not their fault. Right. Or it, he doesn't go, it is their fault or it's not their fault. Well, He's somewhere right. in between where, you know, he keeps that close to his chest. He's a decent chap, is what we're saying. Oh, I, I, I think he is. I, I, I really do. And, and I, I quite like him. I, I thought he was a great player. And, oh, amazing. You know, did, oh. did some amazing things in his sort of super sub role. They could actually... Man United, uh, they got a draw, which we'll talk about in a moment, against Everton on Sunday, which in a way points at Everton isn't bad. Well, it's a lot better than the 4-0 loss they had the year before, yeah. Well, exactly, yeah. <laughs> but Man United are creeping up there, and if they finish in the top four, people will turn around to those of us that have criticised Solskjaer and said he's not the man for the job. We'll turn around and go, you know, when he took over, in those seven during the seven years and up to when he took over, that's one of the best we've done, apart from when Mourinho took them to second. If he gets in the top four, that's job done for Solskjaer. He's been exhausted. Well, I, yeah, the, the, there is that argument, but I think you really do have to look at how all the teams from third on, you know, fourth downwards mm. have performed, and and it really has been after you, Claude, hasn't it? I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Champions League? Oh, not for me. Oh, please, no, no, no. You take, you no, take please, the place. Yeah. yeah, everybody's been giving everybody else a leg up, really, no, haven't they? They really have, yeah. Or, you know, deliberately tripping themselves up. Mm in the process Tottenham you know as, as I've said before on, on this programme this show the criticism of Mourinho some most of it is founded some of it is not blame has to be levelled elsewhere but Tottenham were 14th got as high as 5th and now dropped down again what with Man United winning but that up and down up and down of Man United Tottenham and Arsenal to an extent this season just goes to prove it is a weird season well, yeah, and uh, and the fact that nobody seems to be, you know, Chelsea have been struggling and yet nobody's overtaken them. No, I know, and Chelsea haven't been that good. Not well, really. No, it's, what, their eighth home defeat and the... The yeah. one against Bayern? Yeah, against Bayern. Oh, well, yeah, that was incredible. You you predicted that uh, Chelsea would win yeah, that. Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah. But uh, they were well beaten. And, you know, oh, I think they were they were found out. It, we were shown on that day that Chelsea are not as good as their position would tell you, I uh, think. Well, yeah, that, that's possible. But I, I think you've got to look on the positive side and think just how good that Bayern team was. Yes. The performance, particularly of um, Thiago Alcantara in midfield, was just, it was a masterclass mm. performance. And if you want to understand how... A, a passing midfielder should play. Just watch that game. It was fantastic. And Thomas Muller playing an unusual position for him as a number ten. He just he made everything happen around the penalty area. And he oh just one yeah. wonderful, wonderful team, wonderful performance. And I think they'd have taken apart any 
any Premier League team. Yes, perhaps I was a little harsh. They would have probably done Liverpool as well. I think so, yeah. Yeah, so they, they are that good. But Chelsea, still very, very inconsistent. They beat Tottenham 2-1 the other week and celebrated it at the end of it like they'd won the World Cup and the Champions League in one go. Mm. To beat Tottenham 2-1 at home is no big deal. I'm a Tottenham fan. I think we've lost our way a bit. Not since Mourinho came, but for the last year and a half. I don't think to beat Tottenham 2-1 at home is, is such a great big deal. Chelsea and other teams in the top six should be expecting to beat their rivals yes. at home. Well, they should certainly be expecting to beat Tottenham at home. Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> but but what you know? What's what's the the connection between Wolves and Chelsea regarding beating Tottenham? What do you mean? They both both did it. Well, they both did it. But the managers mm. are both ah, both were both really players under Mourinho. That's true. Yeah, they're both proteges of Mourinho. Yeah. Actually, that's a good point. Yeah. The, the pupil or the student becomes the master and of course the old guard fades out eventually oh, exactly you know the um the the old lion has to stay back in the cave while the young guy hunting or whatever it is but that's what's happened isn't it yeah but you, espirito santo has done a fantastic job at wolves they look very very good they look a good team yes again let's talk about tottenham losing at home to wolves again it's not, for me as a tottenham fan it's not it doesn't mean we should all panic uh, and say that's it we're done for perhaps the season is, is you know we, we want to trot on to the end of the season now get it out of the way but we were losing games like that a year ago. We were losing ga- games like that six months ago. It, nothing has changed. Nothing's got better or worse. It's just I think there is, there's much, much deeper. We said this um, last year that, you know, at Manchester United, at Arsenal, there are deeper problems than just a manager and a few players. I think it's true about Tottenham now. I think we have to, I have to say, look, you know, that maybe the owners have to take a good look at themselves. Oh, I think very much so. This, you know, Mourinho is, is doing what Mourinho does, apart from last week. Because normally, what do you expect Mourinho to do? Defend. Defend. And Tottenham's defence is shocking. We've got, we had a, we had a ter- terrible, terrible defence when he joined us. Mm-hmm. And he's certainly not made it any better at all. Well, taking out Vertonghen and Alderweireld, mm. not, not playing them, didn't really make Tottenham any worse, but didn't make many better. No. You know, Eric Dyer showed that he's not a Premier League centre-back. <laughs> well, well, OK, but I think most people knew that before. I, I really think the, the Tottenham fans who've been bombarding the internet with, oh, we want our club back, well, the, the match against Wolves was, was pure Tottenham, wasn't it? it was, yeah. Yeah, we played some, some decent football for half of the 90 minutes and, and we lost from a winning position. Yeah, That is Spurs, isn't that it? Is that's what very, Spurs do. That's what we call um, the fans, we call Spursy. Yeah. You know, snatching, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory is what we do Yeah, in many ways. Tottenham had 66% of possession, they had a lot of attacks. They actually looked quite attacking, as you yes. say. It was didn't look like his other games that Mourinho's played. No, the, the cracks are there though, and have been for a long time. That that is an old team. I don't mean necessarily age-wise, but they've been together a long time. Then it's uh, shaking up. It needs shaking up. And I think the jury, for me anyway, is out on Mourinho. I'm sh- worried he won't change. Well, he can't change. He is who he is. He is who he is. But we'll see what happens in the summer, how much money he's given and who he buys and what how he then starts to play with whoever he buys. Uh, because Bergwijn has fitted into the oh, team Bergwijn brilliantly, scored an absolute good. screamer again. Uh, he's fitted in very well. Lo Celso not have not been as great as maybe some people expected. But the new players are fitting in. Yes. You can see that some of the older players now, like you say, Dyer is Dyer. Uh, um, some of the older players obviously losing their way a little bit and it's time sometimes it is time to move on um i i think so the, the there is there has to be some changes there but whether whether the the owner and uh, the guy there's levy is it mm. will will spend the money to make it happen is is the question but remember that the, the reason that pochettino left was that levy wouldn't sell players he wouldn't no. get them out yes and that, only, that's got yeah. to happen before you bring players in it has with everybody, of course. You know, we're saying Arsenal have got this loss to contend with. They're going to have to probably have to get rid of Aubameyang just to get new players in. Well, it would certainly help. Yeah. Tottenham will have to. I think Tottenham have got to sell players. There are some that need to go anyway. There are some that need to go. Um, Very much so, yeah. The defence has to go. They have to get a new. Yeah, defense. I think they've got they've got to go and, and and you know work on their their culture in China or something. Yeah, yeah, they're probably ready for that now. Yeah. Or, you know, going to an Italian club where all the other ex-Premier League players seem to go these days. Yeah, possible. Um, possible. But th- I think there needs a shake-up. I, th- I think the midfield, uh, and when they're fit uh, and playing, the strike strike force, if you like, is second to none. It's very, very good, yeah. Um, but the defence is uh, the defensive midfield, possibly, and the defenders need to change. And possibly, Gazaniga is going to be uh, taking up uh, the role of number one goalkeeper from Lloris. I'm wondering how long he'll stay at Tottenham. I, I, I think we can see Lloris leaving at the end of the season, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it'll be a new new look Tottenham next season and then we'll see what Mourinho can do with that. 
Mm. Some of his tactics have been re- very strange. Indeed. You know, I mean, uh, Jermaine Gina said at the weekend that, uh, part, uh, like you, he said, apart from that game, it's been very, every week it's a different formation, a different style, and he, he's not, he said, I don't recognise what they're doing. No, um, I, I agree with him. I, I've, I've not been able to, uh, other than the, the, the predilection in those two games for hitting high balls to Mura, which is a, a strange thing to do to a centre yeah. forward who's five foot eight. But yes, and then you've got Aurea <coughs> at the back there, who just, he's been there for years. Um, and he's just yeah. not been very good. Although, again, he had a good game on... Th- well, <laughs> yeah, he popped up with a goal. Popped I mean, up with a goal, that yeah. extremely well. So, yeah. He stayed no, here. Well, the funny thing was that all the Wolves fans, uh, instead of gasping, there was a sigh of relief because he moved it onto his... Well, they normally say weaker left foot. Yeah. In this case, very weak left foot. Mm. Uh, you've got a defender moving it onto his weaker foot. Everybody's going, oh, that's all right. And then he hits an absolute screamer. So that yeah. was completely unexpected and, let's be honest, out of character. Yeah, but it's, it goes down in the in the history books as a goal. A goal, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it was a very good goal. Mm. Uh, but he's another one that possibly, you know, the jury will soon uh, come in with a verdict. You, you, you would have to think that Mourinho would move him on because he, he does like to be able to trust his defenders. Mm, you can't trust uh, him. You can't no. trust Ori. There's um, a mistake wasting there. Oh, yeah. He, I mean, he can be brilliant, no question of that, uh, but what does that bring with it? And that's mm. the problem. I think with Mourinho, the defence is everything and he wants solid... Mm. Week in, week out, same performances. And he hasn't got that with that lot, I no. don't think. But again, with the mid- midfield, they, they look at sixes and sevens a little bit as well. And then you've got no strikers. So it will, as Jermaine Gina said, and I'm saying, yes, it, we can't see what he's trying to do. But the, the, for me, the verdict will come next season. Mm. But having said that, a lot of fans were saying the same about Pochettino. Week in, week out, we would be last season, we would be at the beginning of this season, losing games or not winning games against teams like Norwich or Aston Villa, where we should have won them. And at the end of it, you read all the you know the fans on Facebook and everything going, what was Pochettino doing? What a ridiculous substitution. Or why did he leave him on? Or what was that for? Why are we playing a diamond formation this week and not last week? So that's not changed. Pochettino in his last year was also messing about with the formation and the tactics. Will the real top, Tottenham Hotspur please stand up? Yeah, but I think th- there is a very good reason for Pochettino doing that. But basically, they hadn't bought anybody for, for two years. He ha- when he had injuries, he, he has to change the team around oh. to, get, to get a team on, on the pitch. Well, that's the same but for Mourinho then. No, it's not the same for Mourinho because they, they got what, how many m- new players? Three, four new players mm. since then? So it is different. It is slightly different, but now we've got no strikers. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, let's just imagine if Harry Kane and Son, or one of the two even, had been fit for the last, how many games is it? Six? Mm. If they'd been fit for those games, how many extra points or w- we would have won or not lost? I think we would have probably, we'd be three points better off than we are. I, was, I would have gone for four points, but yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. We'd have probably at least drawn with Wolves, at least, and probably won one other game at least that we yeah, lost. Um, I think so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's made a big difference. All right, let's move on. What about your lot, West Ham? Well, we looked very good at the weekend. It did. It did. You know, a three nil victory that was yeah. well worth the three nil. Incredible. And Bowen, the the new striker, looked very very good. Mm. Took his goal brilliantly. Lovely chip over the over the advancing keeper. But Antonio was just out of this world. Mm. He's unplayable on Saturday. They they were really good. So was that the real West Ham or was that a very blip? much so? No. Yeah. Well, I mean, it may turn out to be a blip because it's West Ham, and but, <laughs> but that's that's what you can do. And, yeah. and and the secret there is for the manager is okay. You've just shown you can do it. In fact, you've shown it to two matches in a row because they took Liverpool all the way and should yep. have won. Yeah. And they did this against Southampton, whose record away from home is better than their record at home. Mm. So there's there's no reason why West Ham shouldn't go to Arsenal and win. There's nothing to be frightened of at Arsenal. No, no. Well, we'll talk about those games later. But you are playing Arsenal. It's again, it's like Man United. You know, there used to be a time when going to the Emirates or going, especially going to Old Trafford, meant you were going to lost, go, you were going to lose. You yeah. already, you know, the mentality was there. Mm. But yeah, West Ham. I can't believe that. At the weekend, we were watching it when we were doing our radio show for ninety three point. Six Global Radio here on the Costa del Sol. Thanks to them, by the way, for all their assistance. When we were doing the radio show we do for them on a Saturday, we were really quite amazed at how uh, West Ham were doing, and we did discuss the same thing. You know, David Moyes, again, like Mourinho, I think, is a very negative manager. Uh, and yet, y- yes. there they were, West Ham, fl- free-flowing, beautiful football. It's always a fantastic thing to see when a player chips the keeper because mm. that shows that the, when, when the a player is yeah. the confidence and when a player is cheeky means that, without using that word again, mentally he feels relaxed. Yeah. So he's not under pressure, he doesn't feel bullied by the manager, he feels he can show his flair. Yes. So that shows that the team are clicking. 
Yeah, and and Saturday they were very very good. Mm. So let's hope they can do it again. But you know, <laughs> you're still in the relegation zone. Don't get carried away. Well, yeah. you, you know what you have to remember about West Ham, and, and I used to say this to our, our friends in in Russia who who didn't understand British football, <laughs> that. You know, the thing about West Ham, the unique thing, I think, is that our song isn't about how fantastic we are and how wonderful we are and how we're the best in the world. Our song is how we're going to fail. It is, yeah. You <laughs> <laughs> you go, they fly, the bubbles fly so high and then... Uh, nearly reach the sky. And like, and like my dreams, they fade and die. <laughs> That's yeah. our song. Yeah, you actually sing about how yeah. things cannot be achieved. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, let's go on to... Uh, we have to talk about it. VAR, Video Assistant Referee. Oh, dear. Yeah. Uh, point that I, I did sort of occurred to me at the weekend, when people say VAR, you immediately think of technology. Mm. But actually, Video Assistant Referee is referring to a person. Indeed. A singular person sat somewhere, Stockley Park, mm. watching the same game as the referee is watching and then reviewing it by rewinding fast forwarding mm. whatever he does but it video assistant referee is a person like a fourth official it's not Indeed. the technology itself and there was a very contentious i suppose and wrong var decision at the weekend now you watched that that was everton yes. against manchester united talk us through that the everton player shot from from right to left Dave, david de Hyde dived it and would have saved the ball the shot it was deflected off maguire Yes. Thereby putting the player who was previously offside onside. That player was sat on the ground th- and he could not have been offside anyway because he, by definition, was not seeking to gain any advantage by doing so. Mm. Um, he moved his legs out of the way and the ball went in the goal. Now, they managed to try and claim that he was offside. No way. Yep. Not in a million years. If you read the rules, that was a goal. Now, our, our friend Franklin, who is a died in the wall Manchester United fan oh yes he is was, yeah. was next to me watching this and he said you know it's not offside that is a goal well, yeah, uh, Sigurdsson was uh, judged to have been interfering with David De Gea's view from an offside position. That yeah, was well, the ruling. If anybody says that, then they're lying because... Well, that's VAR, the then they're be- lying. Because De Gea's view was unobstructed at all times, and he was on the ground from diving to his right when the ball crossed the line. Even if his view had been obstructed, it still was a goal. Hmm. There's no way he was going to get up, dive across, you know, do a Gordon Banks. <laughs> and that, I mean, it, no, it, the decision was 100% wrong, according to the laws of the game. Um, so that meant that United Manchester came away with a lucky draw then. Manchester United got an extra point. Got an ex- a, extra free point, yeah. What a shock. Mm. Well, it is. There is a table doing the rounds at the moment of how VAR has positively impacted certain teams and negatively mm. impacted others. West Ham are among those who've had a negative impact from VAR. Yep. Tottenham uh, also. Uh, the top team who've been uh, influenced positively is Liverpool. Yeah. No surprise there. Again, we've discussed that before, that yeah. sometimes the, the bigger teams get the rub of the green, especially when they're playing such attractive football, look like they're going to win the league. I kind of think that there's a little bit of, especially referees, a, a little bit intimidated in front of the cop at Anfield when the Liverpool are just desperately 1-0 up and the other team score with minutes to go or don't score or whatever. Mm. I think that there is an influence there. There is always a human influence from a big crowd, of course. Oh, ab- absolutely. But, uh, but I think one of the reasons that the um, Mike Riley and his limited company who run the referees mm. insist on running VAR the way it is is so that they can influence the results of matches. There we are. Well, that's what we're saying. And We've said it before. It's and true. that's what they did then. And that's what they did then. Why they want Manchester United to get the point, I don't know, particularly over Everton, but uh, they do. I don't Because Manchester United are now knocking, they've, they've knocked Tottenham down the table and Man United are now fifth, just a couple of points behind Chelsea. Mm. They, you know, they could knock Chelsea out of the top four. What have Mike Riley and you know the Premier League or whoever else, the other authorities, got to gain from Man United being in the top four rather than Chelsea? Because I, I think they wouldn't want Leicester up there because they're not a big money abroad. They're not going to attract viewers, Leicester. But Chelsea and Manchester United would. So I don't see why they'd want to change that around. You have to remember that there is more money bet on the on every Premier League match mm. every weekend than the total amount of money that Premier League teams get from their TV deals. More right. money than that every single match. Right. So actually what we're saying is it's not viewing figures. It's not trophies. It's the betting so mm. I would have actually put Everton Man United down if I was a betting man I would have put that down as a draw 
I think. I think that had draw written all over it. So well, maybe is that is that what you're saying? They wanted to keep it that way. Well, I don't know. It, it, I mean, it depends. Yeah, you don't, you don't know how the how the no. bookies have laid the money off, or, or you no. know, or, or what the deals are. But I'm absolutely convinced there is. And you know, Mike Riley, you, you would think, would you not, that referees ought to come from you know all all around England. There's there's mm. no particular reason. You might you might think more would come from London simply because of the population. Mm. No, the vast majority of them come in quite a small area in the north. They're Mike Riley's mates. Mm. Now then, I was going to say how controversial of us, and I love it, that we think that, yes, VAR is under the influence of bookmakers and everything oh, else. I don't think there's any question. I think that's but they're also it's brought in. Yeah. So that's the first thing. VAR is tainted by money uh, and influence thereof. But we also think that Mike Riley has gathered a, a little bit of a, a mafia around him from the northeast. Very it much. is the northeast, isn't it? A lot of a lot of yeah, play, uh, yeah. managers, uh, Very, a lot of referees from there. Very much so. And, and if you, you know, if you are a particularly good and famous referee and you get on the wrong side of Mike Riley, you find yourself working in China. Yes, you do. Yeah, we know mm. that. Yeah. And one one other thing to to bear in mind, if you think that that influencing matches in that way could not happen in England because we're English, etc., etc. <laughs> well, it, it, it's a fact that it has happened in Scotland in very recent mem- memory. It's happened mm. in Italy. It's happened in Germany. Um, why do you think it could not happen in England? Well, this is the typical English kind of snobbery about how perfect they are. But actually, if match fixing happens in a place with very, very stable and strong rules like Germany, known for being very conservative in that, if it can happen there, it can most definitely happen in a pretty slow England. And if if anyone would care to look back at the history in the 1960s in England, match fixing was rife. Mm. As the Sheffield Wednesday players who were banned for life found out. And if you read um, any of the uh, you know good biographies about Brian Clough, one of his early criticisms when playing with for Middlesbrough was he he was exasperated talking to the press said I've I've got to score at least three goals for us to win <laughs> because his his teammates were being paid to throw the match to throw the match wow you know so and th- this this was after one three three draw. Mm, he was sus- saying it's very suspect. So it's been happening. It is happening. Of course it is. Just because you don't read about it doesn't mean it's not happening. No. During that game, or actually not during that game, at the end of the game, Carlo Ancelotti was given a red card for remonstrating about that decision. Uh, he's come out since and said that he was not abusive towards the fourth official. He got a red card. But for those of us, or those of you who like silly facts, that means that Carlo Ancelotti has now got more red cards in the Premier League than Robbie Savage, who was quite a tough player. Um, mm. But that's not Ancelotti's first red card, of course. Indeed, it's not. And, and, and it, it was, when you, when you looked at it, it was pathetic by the referee. Absolutely pathetic. I mean, really, it's just yeah. you know, why do why do you not explain to him the question that he's asking him? He's asking you a question. Why not explain it? Yeah. Why why just stand there completely refuse, wind the guy up, and then give him a red, red card? card? Yeah. People, if you, if somebody asks you something and you don't answer answer immediately, they're going to get yes. more and more annoyed until a point where they, it does look like they're abusing you. So just if you answer him straight away, that's it. Okay. Oh, I understand your decision. You're wrong, by the way, but fine. Yeah. At least you've explained it to me. The other the other really interesting thing about about that match was the performance of David De Gea who for the past two seasons has been nowhere near the keeper that he was before. I mean, he's 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 nowhere near the the top ten of keepers in the in the Premier League anymore. And that mistake that he made that gifted Everton a goal was his seventh mistake that's led directly to a goal in the last two seasons. That's he's top of the li- top of the league for giving goals away. Mm. Being a goalkeeper, I think, is a bit like being a drummer in the band. You are kind of... They're all, they always seem to be a breed amongst themselves, and they are prone to... Stri- Hugo Lloris is another one, to being brilliant and then making some ridiculous... They've always got a strange mistake in them for some reason. Well, that's right. I mean, maybe they're not stable or something. Yeah. In, I don't know what it is, but it does seem to me that there is something about goalkeepers that there's always a weird fumble. It's always going to go through their legs or through their hands at one point in the season. Yeah, I don't think they make any more mistakes than any other player, but because they're the last line... If if they bake it, it goes in, it's a goal. So it, yeah. it becomes very visible. I suppose that's what it is. It's like if you're a striker and you miss a sitter, people have forgotten about it two minutes later. But if you let the ball go through your hands, yeah. you're the villain. Well, that's so right. That's, that's why right. you have to be a certain type of breed of person, I think. Yeah, probably. But, you know, the other the other guy who recently has had has made two howlers is Fabianski. Mm. Now, he, oh, yeah. <laughs> he led that league table last season for the fewest mistakes by any goalkeeper. But two in a week, and all of a sudden people are saying Fabianski's not... Yeah. Fabianski's a great keeper. Mm. He's probably the fifth, fifth best keeper in Europe, but he made two mistakes in a week. It, yeah, and also you've got to remember, 
who he, who and what he's got in front of him. Indeed. You know, Hugo Lloris at Tottenham uh, has got a very weak defence in front of him. Mm. So he is going to be highlighted more because he's going to be in the action more. Fabianski's got what's he got in front of him. So well, he's going to be a busy man, <laughs> yeah, in, generally. Indeed. And the stats showed that last year where he came second in the in the, the stats table for, for goalkeeper. But bearing in mind the number of shots he saved, percentage of shots he saved, mistakes he made, etc., etc., he was second behind Alisson. But he had made two and a half times as many saves <laughs> as Alisson. Busy, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, th- I think having Van Dijk in front of you helps you if you're a goalkeeper. Well, there you are, yeah, exactly. If you've got Van Dijk in front of you, you're going to have a quieter afternoon than if you've got... Yeah. I mean, and, and at Arsenal, if you've got <laughs> Louise and... Um, well, there you go. That lot in fr- <laughs> <laughs> if you've got Luis and Socrates and all that lot in front of you, you're going to be a busy person as well, I yeah. think. We're talking about the top four there, Jeff. And Leicester, who's been... I mean, they were actually pushing Liverpool for the title early on in the season. They were, yeah. They were actually pushing them for first place. They've dropped off massively recently. Something's changed at Leicester. Well, what's changed is indeed he is injured and not playing. And it, it's as simple as that. That's He's, a big, big difference. Yeah, those, those nine games so far where... He, ha- he hasn't played. The, s- the stats show it. Let's look at, he's been replaced by Hamza Chaduri. Hamza Chaduri, Leicester with him starting, two wins in eight games. Mm, not great. That, that's not, not great for top four. That's not top four performance, is it? Leicester without Chaduri, 13 wins in 19 games. Top four performance. That's top four <laughs> performance, so there you go. It, it is as simple it's as, as that. It's as simple as that one player being replaced by another. Yeah. There's a very similar thing going on with Chelsea, incidentally. Their performances have dropped off lately. And one of the players that Lampard is, is supposed to be looking to sell is Marcus Alonso, the mm. left-back. He's either left-back or left-wing-back, depending on the formation. Chelsea, with Alonso starting, seven wins in seven games. Mm. Chelsea, without Alonso, six wins in 20 games. That's, re- that's relegation form. That is relegation form, so... They want to get rid of the player that's winning them games when he's playing. Who was a talisman, yeah. And without him, they're bad. Yes. And they want yeah. to get rid of him. Yeah. I think somebody really ought to start looking at the stats at Chelsea. I think somebody ought to start listening to this podcast well, uh, yeah. among the managers. They'll learn something. No, I, you know, I, I would, I'd do a job for them for, you know... <laughs> oh, not very much. Yeah, twenty five thousand a week. I'd, yeah, I'd, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very nice of you. Yeah. Um, you just don't need the money. That's why you're doing right, it so exactly. cheaply. Exactly. <laughs> it's because I'm I'm a generous person. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't see you wanting to do that at United or Arsenal. Oh, you do it at West Ham. Oh, I do it at United. Oh, you do it. You do them. <laughs> oh, you yeah. do them. Yeah. All right, then, Jeff. Let's move on to what's happening this weekend. On Saturday, Liverpool against Bournemouth. Liverpool back to winning ways? I think so, yeah. yeah. Bournemouth, of course, beaten again at the weekend. So Liverpool to beat Bournemouth. The big one, Arsenal against West Ham. <laughs> well, there, there, there is no reason why West Ham should be looking at anything other than a win from that game. Um, <laughs> so I, I know I'm going to go for a win. A West Ham win. Oh, I'm going to go for a draw, but I would love to see you do Arsenal. Crystal Palace against Watford. Crystal mm. Palace were the first team to win on a leap year in the Premier League. <laughs> they beat Brighton 1-0 mm. in Roy Hodgson's 100th game in charge. Narrow 1-0, but still 1-0. But what do we reckon to that one? Crystal Palace are at home to Watford. Victorious over Liverpool, the only team in the league to beat them this season. Yeah, draw, I think. Draw. Yep, all right, I'm going to go for a, a score draw. Sheffield United against Norwich. Desperate Norwich need points here, of course. Sheffield United really pushing for Europe. Yeah, I, th- I think a United win there. All right, uh, Southampton against Newcastle. Southampton win. Southampton win, and a game nobody wants to watch. Well, yeah, and, and <laughs> can, I, can I just point out for long listeners of, the, of this podcast will remember me talking about Joel Linton, that useless centre-forward hired by, <laughs> hired by Mike Ashley for £42 million, yeah, oh God, who's yeah. never scored more than one goal per five games in his entire career, has actually scored one goal in 28 games. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so we're going to go for Southampton. Southampton. Yeah, yeah, Southampton. Wolverhampton Wanderers against Brighton. Wolves win. Got to be a Wolves win, hasn't yeah. it? Victorious over Tottenham at the weekend. Lucky. They were lucky, I tell you. Um, uh, lucky that they were playing Tottenham. Um, L- lucky, <laughs> lucky that they had a better manager. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, moving on. Burnley against Tottenham. Oh, it's going to be a tough game. That is going to be a very That's tough a game. very tough game. A draw. I'm going to go for a Tottenham win. Mm. It's going to. I think Burnley will score because most people can score against that defence as it currently is. But I think Tottenham will overcome them. I think that's a Tottenham win. Chelsea against Everton on Sunday. Oh, that's going to be a difficult game, that mm. is. I'd love to see Everton win that, of course, but I think that's a, a Chelsea win at best a draw for Everton. 
Uh, Although well, Chelsea not great at home, as you've said. No, exactly. I'll go for an Everton win. You'll go for an Everton win. I'm going for a draw. Manchester United against Manchester City. City. Guardiola hailing his team as the best team in the Premier League because they won um, the, the little cup that they won on Sunday against Aston Villa 2-1. Um, Manchester United back up to fifth. I'll go for a City win. Yeah, you'd think, wouldn't you, that City would beat United away. They should. They should. On paper, they should. It's been played on grass. I'm going to go for a draw. That is uh, Manchester United against Manchester City on Monday. Leicester against Aston Villa. A little derby there. The way Leicester are playing, and depending on who plays for them, Aston Villa have a chance there, I think. Yeah, and indeed he came on as sub. So if he starts, Leicester will win. Mm. But, uh, well, hang on, what about Vardy? Is, is he back from injury? Brendan Rodgers said that just because he hasn't scored in nine games doesn't mean that he won't get back to winning ways and he is playing well and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, he didn't didn't play against Norwich. No. um, And that's one of the reasons why they they didn't win. If Vardy and Ndidi play, Leicester win. If not, it's a draw. It's a draw. I'm going to have to go for that as well. On Tuesday, and then... We're back round to next week's podcast, but on Tuesday, before that, RB Leipzig against Tottenham Hotspur. Tottenham one nil down after the first leg. You said we got a one nil thrashing. You did, really did. You played off the park. You can't see some some sudden improvement in Tottenham that's going to mm. overturn that. Leipzig will, will win. Something will have to change between now and next Tuesday. Yes, a week away. If Tottenham come away, this is what I'm saying. If Tottenham suddenly bizarrely find a way of winning at the weekend maybe he'll eventually play Troy Parrott the young kid uh, is the only striker we've got on our books who's a, uh, you know in the first team score maybe he, they'll start playing but I think I think it might be, I think we might come away with a draw which is not good enough and we're out well I don't know I, I think one of the things which, which will affect this is if Leipzig can get their their three defenders back from from injury Tottenham had lost two strikers the entire back three of Leipzig were out injured in the mm. last game that is a good so, point yeah. so I, I, Leipzig should win before we go to your trivia question, talking of Leipzig and German football, just a bit of a fun fact for you, Jeff. Jaden Sancho again scoring at the weekend. Indeed. And the last time he didn't score, West Ham were third in the league. That's how long ago that was. He <laughs> just can't stop scoring or assisting goals. He is just sensational. He is a phenomenal player. Let's just let me give you some stats. 14 assists this season. That's so phenomenal. He leads, he leads the Bundesliga in assists, and he's the third highest goal scorer. Amazing. Yeah, incredible. He's, he's an incredible player. And and why he's not the first name on on the England on the England sheet, I do not know because there isn't a better English player. Yeah, and we've watched you and I together watched England play the last few games over the last few months. And sometimes he's not in the in the first team, and we're, we're, we're the, yeah. the starting eleven, and we look at each other and go, "Well, got Henderson playing for goodness sake. You've got you know all these other players, and yet Jaden Sancho is on the bench at best. I don't understand. Is the usual excuse from managers, and Mourinho said it about Troy Parrott is he's a very good kid, he's very very talented, but we've got to be very careful in nurturing him, and it's going to be a slow process. And Gary Southgate is saying exactly the same about Sancho that he doesn't want to push him too far too soon, and you I think that's ridiculous. He's He's playing at the very top level in in the joint top mm. best mm. league in Europe. What, what? Why do you need to protect him? He I doesn't know. need protecting. No. He's, he's not a, a you know a, a shrinking violet. He's no, a very, no. very confident young man mm. who knows what he's doing and does it incredibly well. And uh, possibly next season he may be at a Premier League club. I would think there's a very high chance, mm. and, unless one of the big two in Spain get him first. You know, he's playing in, the, in the, as you say, the joint best league mm. in, in uh, Europe. Does he need to move? I don't know. I, I, I mean, at Tottenham, I, it'd be fantastic. He's not going to go to a team like Tottenham. It would have to be a Liverpool, a Man City, maybe even Manchester United because they've Look, got the he's, money. He's playing Champions League football. He's not going to go to anyone who isn't playing. Yeah, Champions no, League football. No, no. But what an incredible talent. All right, that's all we've got time for, but it is time for the uh, question and answer to your trivia question for this week. Right, OK, which was which four players have scored the most goals for England while they were Chelsea players? OK, and now I gave you George Hilsden, 1907 to 1909. <laughs> Remember who, him well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Played for West Ham, then he played for Chelsea, and then he went back to West Ham. His brother Jack, yeah, his brother Jack it, yeah. played for West Ham as oh, well. Oh, did he? Yeah. Right. I mean, so he went to, he was at West Ham, he thought, I'll go to Chelsea, didn't like it, and went home again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The other players, most most people really should get the other three players. They are Frank Lampard, Jimmy Greaves, mm. and Tommy Lawton. Tommy Lawton. Mm. Right. 
Sounds like a mu- sort of music hall p- uh, comedian. No, oh, Lampard, Greaves and Lawton, the law firm, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, and they've had some brushes with the law themselves. Indeed. Uh, have, but yeah. those are the guys. Well done. What an interesting question. Thank you for that. As I say, that's all we've got time for. We'll be back with more Hitting the Bar next week. You can find us, of course, on Spotify, Google Podcasts and iTunes, just to name but a few. And you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Chris Cole. I'm Jeff Saunders. And that was Hitting the Bar, the football podcast.